Okay, David, I'm going to make you the presenter now, passing you the baton. Really looking for, forward to uh, speaking with you because I know you have some conviction about what's happening. Okay, Dale, can you hear me? I can, David. Welcome back to FACE. Hey, thanks for having me back on, Dale. Yeah, you know, uh, I follow you on Twitter a lot, David, and uh, you provide a lot of uh, real interesting comments and content, and I was excited to invite you back, and uh, even the timing's great because uh, you actually use the word, let's get right to it, that you think we're entering a crisis. So um, I'm interested uh, uh, in what your reasons are and, you know, what you believe uh, are asset classes that we could take advantage of it and avoid. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, given the time uh, allotted, Dale, I won't get into the specifics of why this is, why I, uh, this crisis is about to occur. Uh, you know, we can talk debt mountains, budget deficits, etc. Uh, I will get into uh, real-time discussion about why I think the financial crisis has already begun. Okay. Um, yeah, let uh, me take a guess. Is it led by a sovereign debt crisis? Uh, yes, it's 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 led by the sovereign. It's by higher bond yields, a drop in stocks, drop in the dollar. Uh, we'll get into the details, but I, I do want to segue into the data this morning because it it you know it segues really well with the discussion we're about to have. So the CPI is higher than expected. You know, higher inflation, higher yields, higher higher dollar. But for me, uh, inflation is a lagging indicator. Uh, retail sales were awful. Uh, the headline was minus 0.3%, the core flat. That's way lower than expected. And yet the dollar goes up, yields go up, gold, silver, platinum, the precious metals all go down, and stocks get hammered again. So, uh, you know, we can't trust the first move, uh, but this move only makes sense to the extent that markets are truly scared that the Fed no longer has its back and rate hikes and balance sheet reduction continues as planned. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, uh, this also shows that the market knows that the Fed care, could care less about the economy because you know, if retail sales are weak, that's a better leading indicator of inflation going forward. Consumption in the US economy is a better le leading indicator of inflation going forward than a retrospective uh, piece of data like the CPI. So to me, the, the market reaction shows that uh, the market is well aware the Fed is less concerned about the economy, but more concerned about getting rates uh, as high as possible, as fast as possible, and uh, reducing their balance sheet as soon as possible, per the plan they laid out in September, uh, in order to have ammunition for the recession and the market downturn that's about to occur. So, you know, let's discuss why I believe that, you know, a financial crisis has begun. We're having our Bear Stearns moment right now, I call it. We'll use the 2007-2008 uh, crisis as uh, a, a, you know, a reference point, if you will. Um, in times of crisis, fundamentals tend to take over. They take on more importance than technical sentiment, positioning, and other forms of analysis, in my opinion. Um, and when I say fundamentals, I mean central bank policies, and specifically those of the Fed. Uh, the Fed and the global central uh, bank policies have dominated the markets for years. You know, stocks, bonds, foreign exchange, yes. uh, commodities, the lot. Uh, I believe we're undergoing a sea change in those policies, at least in the US, by going from QE to QT. Uh, quantitative tightening uh, is the order of the day. The punch bowl has been taken away. Uh, and, you know, I want to. Uh, reference this article that Lee Adler posted on online on Saturday, basically stating that the Fed is intent on raising interest rates and reducing its balance sheet, as it outlined back in September. Uh, he called it the most drastic tightening of monetary policy in history. He pointed out that yields started to rise in September once the balance sheet reduction program was announced, as we can see here. Yes. Um, you know, the 10-year rose from 2.05% up to, this is a uh, day ago or so, so it's 2.86, but it's been as high as 2.89, I believe. But this is the highest level since 2014. 
Now, tax cuts, higher government spending uh, just balloon the already, already huge budget deficit and requires Treasury to issue more debt, which means greater supply of bonds. This is at a time when the Fed is not rolling over much of its investments in US Treasuries anymore, and our biggest foreign buyers are purchasing less. This means less demand for bonds. So, okay, so uh, we're basically rates could go up, not yeah. because of economic growth, but the Fed controls short rates, but long rates can go up because of more supply and less demand. Exactly. I was going to say economics 101, more supply, less demand means higher, uh, lower prices, higher yields. So we could have higher yields without dramatically higher GDP. Yes. Got it. Absolutely. You know, the, the Fed, the, the yield curve was flattening for quite some time. And now all of a sudden we're getting a reversal. I do not believe the data that says that the U.S. economy is growing strongly. I know the mainstream media likes to cite that data point and it points to government statistics uh, showing that. But you know, one of the pieces of data that I like to look at that I feel is one of the least manipulated is the Federal Reserve, uh, sorry, the federal tax receipts. And the Federal Reserve, uh, sorry, federal tax receipts They've been in and out of recession, uh, showed us to be in and out of recession since 2016. And in other words, they've gone positive. I actually, I think I have the chart here somewhere so I can share. Okay. So uh, your your view of what's happening in the business world is how much Uncle Sam gets from everybody, corporations, individuals, et cetera. Um, could, could they be affected by, you know, tax evasion or, uh, without repatriation, and now we're going to have repatriation. Could that increase tax receipts with the new tax law? You, you I mean, that is part of the plan, I'm sure. But I, you know, I'm not expecting a huge boon to tax receipts as a result of, uh, of the repatriation, personally. Yeah, I mean, in this recovery with what the stock market did and everything, that's uh, a pretty good decline from 2011 to where we are now. Yeah, and look look back at what happened, you know, post yeah. the dot com bust. Look what happened in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. It's a pretty reliable indicator of recession uh, or pending recession, and the trend is clearly down. That's very uh, interesting, David. Thanks. For, you know, I never looked at it that way. I learned something new from you today. I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, you okay. know, I mean, that's part of the reason, of course, you know, I'm a humanitarian and I want to edify other people. But, you know, I learn every day when I bring guys like you in here. So, that, you know, thank you for this, Pearl. Well, I appreciate that. You know, so I'm done. Uh, thanks for having me on, Dale. And uh, I'll speak to you next time. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> my job is done. No, I, my, point, my point is. Sorry to interrupt you, Dale. My point is that you know when you hear the mainstream media talking about how well the economy is doing and this justifies higher rates, you know I, I just don't buy it. And it's data like this which uh, reinforces my argument, I believe. Okay. Um, I, I believe that the uh, bond yields are going up basically due to supply and demand factors. Um, the short end is uh, going higher also uh, because inflationary expectations have increased. That has been driven by higher taxes, higher government spending, talk of a 1.5 trillion infrastructure plan, and not least a weaker dollar. It's been falling since January 2017. So, all so are you these... looking for a continuation of that? I know some people are thinking maybe from lower levels we have a bear market rally, but uh, your uh, your your belief is that this downtrend in the dollar, uh, without you know. Uh, without uh, bear market rallies is headed down in a uh, fairly dramatic way? Yeah, I think it's headed down, yes. And, you know, uh, actually, I was going to start talking about the effect of these policies on stocks, as okay. we've seen. That's fine. Um, and uh, why, you know, one of the uh, precursors to a financial crisis is an increased correlation between assets across the board. And I pointed this out on Twitter back in January that we were seeing heightened correlation, both direct and inverse, between the dollar, the S&P, bonds, oil, and gold. Across and crypto. And crypto. And, and crypto as well. Yeah, everything. 
And everything this, everything was a balloon with a different amount of oxygen or helium in it. Hey, yes, exactly. All right. what, what this told me, based on experience with 2007 and you know 99, was that when you get increased correlations across asset classes that are usually um, used for diversification purposes, in other words, that they uh, trade uh, differently to one another, yet they're either perfectly or uh, perfectly positive or perfectly negatively in, uh, correlated to one another, that's a sign of trouble. And sure enough, here we are. Now, uh, stocks, and the reason I bring this up is stocks are having a little bit of turmoil right now. It, to me, it's no big deal. Uh, the Fed has said it perfectly. You know, given where we've come from, this is a storm in a teacup. However, I, I don't believe it's going to get, it's going to get better in the short term. But it's not going to get better down the road. I believe I call this the Bear Stearns moment for a reason because I believe the Lehman-like moment is coming. Okay. And, yeah. and that's later, that's later in the year. And one of the few tools or one of the few cushions for that blow uh, to, to stocks that'll keep them propped up in the meantime is a weaker dollar. If they're green, you saw it in the past couple of days, and you see it this morning. Well, you saw it all last year, right? Weaker dollar is a tailwind for uh, equities, commodities, and a stronger dollar is a headwind. Yeah, I, I just think it becomes clearer now, Dale, because we've got a two-way market finally in yeah. stocks again. Last year it was a one-way market. Was it the dollar? Was it central bank stimulus? Was it blah, blah, blah? Okay. Now, it's, now that we've got a two-way market in stocks again, you can clearly see that a higher dollar is negative for stocks. A weaker dollar is positive. And if you doubt it, just look at the, the action of the past three days. This morning, what's the do Dixie doing this morning? And what's the stocks doing? The Dixie is up, stocks are down. Exactly. And that's why I think that I, I believe stocks are going to get a, yields are going to come down. They're oversold and over, uh, over bearish. The yields are going to have a rally here shortly. Uh, stocks are going to rally also, in my opinion. Uh, but it's going to be a temporary reprieve for what comes later this year. And so, a, so do you think that the big break later this year, David, in equities is going to be a comp accompanied by a dollar rally? Yes. I, I, it, typically, if you look back you know, uh, 2008, the dollar benefits from capital inflows in times of crisis. Okay. For many reasons. I mean, it's, you know, it's the dollar, but more importantly, uh, the U.S. market is the most liquid market in the world, and you know, the emerging markets, uh, other investments abroad, tend to flow into the U.S. in times of crisis. Now, I think it will be temporary, because the reaction uh, I expect from the Fed following that crisis will uh, weaken the dollar. And why do I think the markets are going to go back down again is a, a question I've received a lot. I think the markets are testing the new Fed share of Powell. Uh, they want to, to find out where is the Fed put? Does it still exist? Where is it? And they're going to push markets down until the Fed relents, until the Fed reverses course and does a 180. Um, so, uh, David, again, I know I interrupt a yeah. lot, but there, but there, there are historical precedents for the markets testing Fed chairmen, right? Go back to Greenspan. He had the 87 crash upon him in a short yeah. period of time. And then you had Bernanke, who had the financial crisis uh, shortly yeah. after his uh, nomination and taking the chair. So yeah. uh, they're going to test Powell out, too. Yeah, exactly. They knew Yellen had their back. This new yeah. guy walks in the door. Uh, he's we, a lawyer. We want to know what, he's a lawyer. His, sorry? He's a lawyer. He's a lawyer, yeah. <laughs> They, they want to know if the lawyer has their back. <laughs> we know that's not. We know yeah. that's not possible. Yeah, that, that would be the lawyer that's had your back or your pocketbook. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we had the bump in yields. Uh, it took a while for stocks to catch up. We're seeing that right now. Um, the inflation expectations have obviously popped as well. And that's one of the drivers of this weakness in stocks because they're expecting, you know, it justifies higher interest rates, uh, justifies the reduction in the balance sheet, etc. But I will, as Lee Adler pointed out 
Uh, the reduction of the balance sheet is critical. And as Jim Rickards and Brandon Smith pointed out, uh, you know, something that hasn't been reported in the mainstream media, but it was critical to the drop in stocks on that Friday post the FOMC, was the announcement that the Fed had cut their balance sheet by over 20 billion. Now, this wasn't a, a big number given it's four trillion balance sheet, but it was bigger than anything previous, and it showed that they were keeping to their plan uh, to cut the balance sheet, uh, the assets on their balance sheet, you know, 10 billion a month, now it's 20 billion a month, then it'll be 30 billion a month, then it goes up to 600 billion annually as a run rate uh, going forward. So if the Fed is going to keep to this, at the same time they're hiking interest rates, for stocks that are heavily reliant on QE, I would argue that QE is uh, central bank stimulus, is the primary reason for the stock market rally since 2009. Uh, we can debate that all day, but that's my belief. So, well, uh, exactly. It forced people to take risk because they were getting 0% to be a saver. So, you know, that's how we came up with Tina. There is no alternative but stocks. So, the Fed did that with repression and savers got punished and risk takers got rewarded. True, I would argue as well that the bonds that they purchased from the banks in that quantitative easing process, the primary dealers, et cetera, the, taking the toxic securities, those mortgage-backed securities off the bank's books, uh -huh. supplied the banks with a lot of cash, you know, two trillion plus, that sits on the Fed balance sheet as in, in interest on our excess reserves, which they're earning interest on but they can use that cash to invest in something like the stock market. And you know, it's well known that the Swiss National Bank and the Bank of Japan buy foreign assets. The Swiss National Bank publishes its data. But I do believe that the banks, the commercial banks themselves have plowed money in because the correlation between the Fed's balance sheet and the stock market is, you know, some would say you can have spurious correlations. This one's too obvious to ignore. And, uh, that's one of the reasons why I think taking the punch bowl away, you, you don't even have to cut QE, you just have to stop it. And like any Ponzi scheme, and I'm going to use that term, uh, it collapses. You need increasing inflows for uh, a scheme such as this to be sustained. If you simply stop providing those funds, or worse, removing them, subtracting funds, the, the system collapses. And I think that's what's unfolding right now. The punch bowl has been taken away. As Lee pointed out, the Fed is intent on reducing its balance sheet. It's on autopilot. Uh, their inflation expectations have soared. Rate hikes uh, justifies not just three, but potentially more. Uh, you know, we've had a few Fed speakers come out and suggest that is indeed the case, that we're good on three, we may even do four. And this is spooking uh, stock investors. Yes. So, you know, David, wasn't there, uh, I remember reading, even when uh, the punch bowl was still being filled up, that uh, central planners were getting less bang for the buck as far as it being converted into growth. Uh, they weren't getting the same return on investment by continuing QE. Do you recall that? So that was already starting to happen before yes. they, yeah, okay. So, it, you know, it ends up not working anyway. What was their choice? Keep throwing uh, good money after something that's not working? All right, so uh, uh, go ahead uh, with your, uh, yes. that S&P chart, you know. Yeah, no, exactly, um, Dale. The, you know, I don't want to get into conspiracy theory, but these days conspiracy theory tends to turn out to be conspiracy fact. But... Uh, you, you're exactly correct. There were diminishing marginal returns on QE. So what does the Fed do? They know that their existing tools can't continue to prop up the market. Well, let's let some air out of the tire. Right. And, you know, uh, when the next crisis occurs, this gives us the, I mean, or the excuse uh, to execute some pretty extreme measures in order to keep the boat afloat. And I think, to your point, that that is uh something that has something to do with what's happening right now and 
Fed, you know, Chair Powell said on November 27th, we must be prepared to respond decisively and with appropriate force to new and unexpected threats to our nation's financial stability and economic prosperity. That's a strange statement to make when you've just been nominated for the job. I mean, like the world's falling apart. I thought everything was rosy. Um, this is a whatever it takes kind of statement that Draghi made uh, to support the euro and uh, EU sovereign debt. And it tells me that the next, when the next crisis occurs, which I believe is going to be later this year, the Lehman moment, as I call it, likely pre-midterm uh, elections, uh, the Fed will respond with the put, and they're going to respond in style. Uh, I, now, I could be wrong with this outlook, I'll be honest. We, we, we talked about it on a previous call back today. I'll admit it, I, I don't know, but this is what I expect. They've always responded with increasingly extreme measures. Well, given that this is the everything bubble, uh, when it starts to crack, they're going to want to respond or need to respond with extremely draconian measures. And, uh, well, draconian in the reverse, I'm sorry. And here we are, QE infinity, uh, physical cash ban, you need that in order to enable what's next. And uh, something I abhor is negative interest rates. You know, paying someone to lend them money. That's a great idea. So do you uh, think it was a test case for democracies, what Modi did in India? And that's why, and, and here we go, this could happen here with bail-ins and everything. So, you know, if you're stashing $100 bills, you have to go to lower denominations and you probably have to diversify out of the dollar before the fall. Is that what you're thinking here? Yeah, you, you nailed it, Dale. The India, the cash-based society, 95% of transactions were based on cash. If, so, if we can, if we can uh, implement a physical cash ban in India, it's going to yeah. work anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's more people there, and, you know, the country didn't melt. Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people suffered because it was cash and carry, a lot of cash and carry, but it's not as cash and carry here in the U.S. Everything's your debit, credit card. Anyway, and do you think they let Bitcoin and the whole crypto experiment happen so that the public embraced crypto and they would think it's really cool to have a federal cryptocurrency where they know everything we do? I, I, I think we are on the same page in more yeah. respects than wow. I thought. You, you've been following my tweets. Yes. Uh, actually, I would go further no, and say we're that. just kindred spirits, David. <laughs> uh, I'm not Kreskin. I can't read your mind, but you know, I, I've been talking about these things for a while, and they scare the hell out of me. So I, anyway, I don't believe in coincidence, there. Yeah, uh, providence. Yes, uh, I mean, we, we, exactly. We talk about India. You could yeah. talk about Cyprus and Greece on the Balins uh, side. Yeah. Uh, you've got the Bitcoin uh, with regard to digital currencies. You've got Japan, et cetera, with regard to you know, Sweden, with regard to negative interest rates. The examples uh, are left, right, and center. And that's why I said when I shared this slide with a bunch of people, they were like, oh, that'll never happen in the US. Uh, yeah, that's impossible. Really, because it's happening everywhere else. I mean, wealth tax. A wealth tax, you know, they're going to, you know, charge everybody, you know, five, ten percent on their wealth, you know, assets yeah. minus liabilities. That never happened. Oh, really? Uh, France and Switzerland and Italy all have versions of that right now. They're, they're not banana republics. So, uh, and each of these, we've done QE before, as you uh, pointed out, the uh, cash, physical, large denomination bills were banned in India, and they were right. fine. Negative interest rates, Sweden, Japan, elsewhere, Balin, Cyprus, Greece, uh, capital controls, they've been around forever. Asset seizures, well, you know, we, we've already seen some of that in the US, and then wealth taxes. I think Powell's going to unleash monetary insanity on the US economy, and you'll see some other similar uh, moves around the world, given the extent of the uh, downturn that's coming. And, you know, could I be wrong? Yes, but... If you prepare for the maybe war, maybe in the timing, maybe in the timing, you could be wrong. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know, because you know, I follow some pretty good people, and uh, uh, you know, the one one guy I have in mind, and even you know, guys here called this correction in the market, but this one person I'm thinking of actually thinks 
the S&Ps make new highs and actually that the bull market in stocks is not over until uh, 2020 and about 4,200 in the S&P and then a generational bear market. Do you well, think, then, I, do you think I it all things together that long? Well, actually, that's precisely my view. The, 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 you know, let, let me clarify. So then these things, these things that you're talking about, um, will they happen? They won't happen during, before we top, do you think? Or they happen on the crash that you show starting mainly somewhere in 2019? Yeah. Uh, so you to, uh, I lay it out clearly. Um, this is the first moment. We pop to a higher high of 3,000, 3,200, 300 this yeah. summer. Then we drop in this crisis pre midterm elections, uh, make sure that the GOP gets wiped out. Trump gets the blame. That's yeah. going to be you know, later this year. And then the Fed responds and we get a nice rally up to a blow off top from 20, 2,000 to 2,100 low, double up to 4,000, which you know, marries well with the. You know, oh, wow. And, so, but all these draconian things. Do you think they'll happen during any of the green action or it'll happen during the red action going down? The the uh, the extreme measures that will be introduced by Powell will be in response to the Lehman event later this year. Okay, so in the fall. And then in people the, actually yeah. embrace it and the market blows to 400 and the Fed saved us again. Yes, but the problem they, is... We don't need our $100 bills. We'll pay a wealth tax. Anything to, you know, save the stock market, we'll do our part. Exactly. But if they're going to monetize everything in the process, buy debt, buy stocks, et cetera, uh, universal in income benefits get rolled out, not just in Stockton or Finland, but uh, broadly, et cetera, you're spilling money onto the economy. That infrastructure, 1.5 trillion uh, infrastructure spending, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. They'll do anything and everything to keep this uh, game going. Okay. And uh, that'll lead to a pop, to blow off top. Now, you don't have to get into specific figures. I just threw a 4K on there. Wow. But my time frame matches what, what your friend said, yeah. which is 2021 time frame. That's when it all comes home to roost. That's okay. when we're going to begin the, a multi-year bear market. And what a great problem with this, not only not only do nominal values drop significantly, uh, Dale, but real values because the dollar will be you know thrashed in the process with all this money printing that's going. Okay, so that that's going to be uh, probably at the end of the year. You think that might be a good time to be looking at gold the end of uh, this year? Well, actually, I, uh, I had a whole other presentation on gold, but I think gold is one of those things that you buy and you stash away, you let it collect dust, it's always a good time to buy gold. Yeah, but I think that... Buy gold, gold, buy gold and wait. Yes, and I, I, as, I, as we talked about initially, um, uh, you were in, this was a part of the discussion with your previous presenter, which is the, you know, the direction for gold, uh, sorry, for the dollar. Uh, if stocks Keep, remain under pressure, the dollar is going to have to go get weaker, and that is going to be beneficial for gold and silver. There's a reason gold is resilient right now. And I do see a lower uh, dropping in the short term, but I don't necessarily see lower lows. Uh, but I do see that once this crisis hits in later part of the year, gold and metals may come under pressure because there's a, 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 you know, a hugely negative stock market is uh, deflationary in the short term, but the response from the Fed and global central banks will be hugely positive for gold and silver, in my opinion, and negative for fiat currencies, all of them. And, okay. you know, I, I will just leave you with a couple of charts. Whenever I get, you know, uh, comments about whether or not... Doom, do people... Well, uh, Get turned off when you talk about these things. Well, when they, well, no, no. I think they're starting to come around now that they see there's a two-way market again. I mean, when Bitcoin was going through the roof, I was saying, guys, there's futures markets coming. The manipulation is coming to town. You know, take your profits and run. Nobody, well, few listened, and 
you know, uh, QED. Uh, the same with stocks. I was uh, getting pushback. I posted on January 12th on Twitter that we're going to get a two-way market in the stocks uh, this year. For the first time in a while, we're going to see a correction followed by a bigger one. And I got major pushback in that, and here we are. So uh, I'm hoping I'm developing a level of credibility where, yes, it's an opinion, but it, it's, it's worth considering. And you know, with, with, res with respect to gold, um, you know, you get a lot of naysayers, but even when I get a little concerned about the downside and so forth, I just pull out these three charts. This one from uh, uh, Ronald Storfla at uh, Incrementum uh, is a classic. Everybody shared it, even uh, Jeffrey Gundlach. It shows that commodities, and I don't think gold is money, it's not a commodity, but it's treated as such, are hugely undervalued. Uh, I'm a cycles guy from a big picture perspective, so gold, the prospects for gold and silver going forward are hugely positive. Uh, there's a second one from Chris Aron, uh, a great chart showing gold relative to the S&P. And here we are down here somewhere. I'd have to get a magnifying glass to see yeah. how undervalued gold is. This has to correct, yeah, and, and it will. And lastly, I, I have two people I have to thank for my uh, view on gold long term, and that's these two guys. <laughs> the, the biggest buyers of gold. Uh, yeah, they are. And and you know what? China's been stockpiling wheat, so they yes. they also see some type of. Uh, that's part of these cycles too, is uh, you know food shortages and drought and La Nina and all of that stuff. So yeah, uh, they're they're they look like they're pretty tight. And and they've also uh, developed an alternative to the SWIFT system, haven't they, David? Yes, they, they have. China has developed that. I mean, that's part of the whole uh, argument with regard to a weaker dollar is the de-dollarization process that's been led by China and Russia. That includes a non-dollar payment system. The Petro One is coming online on March 26th. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge deal. Uh, Russia has banned trade in dollars uh, at its ports. Um, you know, China's buying uh, oil in, or trying to buy oil in yuan. It's got bilateral agreements with Russia to do so. It's trying to force the Saudis to do the same. It, it, it's all moving in that direction. So whether it's tomorrow, this year, or you know, 2020, 2021, I think the dollar's days as the global reserve currency are numbered, and we're going to move to a supranational currency. Which, if you read Willem Middelkoop's book, The Big Reset. Yeah. Yeah. The Chinese have been very outspoken about this. That that's their goal, and the Chinese and the Russians are chess players. They play the long game, not quarter to quarter, day to day. They play the long game, and they're playing it extremely well. Right. We're playing checkers while they're playing chess. Yeah, perfectly put. <laughs> you know what, David? What a great interview. Uh, will you show your website for our viewers uh, that are here live and for the recording so that people know how to reach you and keep in touch as things continue to evolve and uh, sure it's uh, globalprotraders.com is uh, my website this is it here uh, I can you know, go out so you can see the front page and uh, you can reach me on Twitter at global pro trader without the s and uh, yeah I, I, re I recommend that you come in and just pay a visit it's free you don't have to pay anything there's no credit card details just an email when you don't get any spam it's it's just to register and uh, you know share your, share your views share your analysis uh, yeah. get some input from other people and the one thing I like about this site opposed to others is as you know Dale I take a holistic view with regard to my analysis in the short term which is FIPES, Fundamentals into Market Analysis, Positioning, uh, Elliott Wave Theory, Sentiment and Technicals. And I also consider manipulation, uh, especially in these central bank distorted markets. So I think that's unique to this site. And yeah, we've got some great people on here, as you can see. And, yeah, and you always give credit to p other people's work. Uh, I really admire that about you. You know, you show charts and you, you know, and I, I also admire that you're thanking Vlad and 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 Chi for, uh, you know, being a good reason to own gold. So, uh, <laughs> you know, really an outstanding presentation, David. I think it's a primer for everyone living in this world of a lot of uncertainty right now that things might be changing 
to at least consider uh, what they're going to do now that um, things are not just one way and becoming much more volatile. I think the VIX was uh, the bell going off that things have changed. Exactly. And if I could, Dale, can I just make a couple of comments? One on gold, take this uh, S&P chart and flip it, and that's my uh, projection for gold, um, without the major downturn. That's what I expect for gold going forward. It's the most undervalued asset, and silver even more so, and it's going to take off. And the other comment I would make is, and this is my parting comment, if there's one thing I would uh, recommend everyone focus on uh, from a big picture perspective, perspective in these volatile markets is focus on what the Fed is doing in terms of quantitative tightening and when it's going to reverse. Focus on what the Fed is saying. They are critical right now. We've got a two-way market. They are driving the bus. Just follow what they are saying and doing. And when they reverse policy, uh, which I believe is going to be later this year in the Lehman type uh, crisis, uh, that's when you know that stocks are going to take off again. That's when you know bond yields are going to go down because they're going to be buying every bond out there. And it's the dollar is likely going to uh, pop initially, but then go south again, and precious metals will take off at that point, in my opinion. David, my trading warrior brother, thank you for your time and and excellent presentation, real nice visuals, along with uh, a very uh, interesting outlook. And glad I had you here out now that we've crossed the Rubicon. So thanks again, buddy. I appreciate you being here. All right, uh, great. In oh, you know, we're, we're gonna do it again. You and I are gonna get back together here on base, um, definitely going into the fall to see what's happening here. and. Uh, just get an, another update on where your head is at at that point. But I, re, I really appreciate all the pearls you uh, shared with us today. There are enough pearls to string a necklace. <laughs> so th thank you again, David. Thanks, Dale. Bye-bye. All right. Okay, everybody. So that's going to be a wrap today. Uh, looks like the dollar faded. So I made a lucky guess on trading the strong hot cpi number we'll see everyone uh tomorrow right so tomorrow's thursday we're live streamed by investing.com good luck the rest of your day see you in the private chat you're welcome kareem tosin thank you hi steven and remember everyone no matter what the markets are doing don't just count your pips count your blessings see everyone tomorrow thanks again david Thank you, Dave.